Hello, everyone. Uh, our next guest will be here any moment now. Um, if you don't know her, her name is Laurence Tubiana. She's the executive director of the European Climate Foundation. And she also played a um, huge role in the Paris Agreement um, in 2015. She was one of the key architects of the agreement. Um, so she she's really, really interesting guest. Um, and she will also share um, her perspective on uh, gender issues in the climate space, um, climate diplomacy. So stay tuned. Here she is. I've already introduced you um, and given your credentials, um, of course, the fact that you are the executive director um, of the European Climate Foundation, but also, of course, um, one of the key architects of the Paris Agreement. Um, and you are here to talk about gender. I mean, we will talk about you know, climate uh, as well, but uh, from a gender perspective. Um, so the, the first question that I do want to ask you is um, gender equality and clean energy transition. You don't necessarily think that they're connected, but how are they connected? In fact, they are. Uh, first, we have to consider that the energy issues and the energy matters, you know, the business sector, the public sector as well, even the investors are very, very men dominated. Uh, and that was the case for climate many, many years ago when I started, many years ago, <laughs> just to deal with that. We really were very few women taking the floor or being in the room even. Uh, in the delegations, there was very, very few women because, because of course, energy is very central to, to climate and to energy transition by definition. And, um, and so that was very sort of because of all the engineer element, uh, that was very little women represented. And still it's the case when you look at <coughs> the energy companies, for example, I think at the head level, it's less than two or three percent at global levels that are head of uh, utilities or energy companies. In France, I think it's only one, uh, NG. Uh, I know one who is a CEO of a big oil company in US, but really there are few people. Different, a little bit better in the renewable energy sector, Globally, there is a little bit more employment. Again, not big, a big difference, but still 20%, a little bit more than that on the oil and gas sector, 30 and something on the renewable sector. So it's a little bit more women investment and, and careers, but still at not the head level. So I think there is a, an issue there about, uh, and with when you look at finally the studies and the academia, there is a lot of, women in the, you know, at the master program or beyond that, that are looking and doing energy, a lot of, of them. I, for example, in the sort of fame, most famous school in France, a high school, after, of course, universities, um, <clears throat> what we call Les Grandes Écoles, a polytechnic, which is normally where the, all the engineers are coming from in the energy sector. There are a lot of women and massively more women than men are now doing the studies because they are just better. At, at mass and, uh, but so there is a disconnect between the profession and the training. So I think it's a very good thing that we are dealing with that issues. It seems not connected, but they are. The other element is that in the energy crisis, it was a very interesting study of, uh, you know, Eurostat, that in Europe after the um, invasion of Ukraine by Russia, uh, you know, we had this energy crisis, the price of energy, the bills were up. And there was a huge difference into how it has affected the households. And when, of course, there was a classical case of um, uh, sort of uh, only women with children with their own uh, sustain, well, that have to sustain themselves on a one person uh, family, they were really, really uh, more affected. And the indicator was they could not pay the bill. So there was more women unable to pay the bills than the equivalent in the men's sector. So for all this reason, poverty, 
inequality in general, and that affect, of course, energy transition because it's not like because energy will be particularly anti-women, but the reality is that because it's so central to the household, to the basic needs, you see that poverty, of course, we know affect more women and that's the consequence. So if energy transition could be a factor of more equality, I think we should rejoice that. And I think there is a true possibility now for that. In other words, if, if I don't want to say that the energy transition goes wrong because we're not hoping for that. But if if we do see, um, you know, hurdles along the way that could potentially impact women in in households because they are usually on the front lines of of you know taking care of families of health. Um, and, I mean, could that be a, a, a possibility? Is that what you're saying? Yes, there is two two dimension of that. There is a sort of the household level, and then there is a of course the or the, the, the sector, the business sector. On the household level, uh, of course, to to have access to cleaner energy depends very much of how, of course, the electricity market is organized. But as well, when you see the access, for example, to more autonomous, decentralized, in a way, production of electricity, for example, the problem, of course, the major problem is access to capital to fund that. Uh, even if now, of course, in our countries, in France in particular, and some or Germany, there is a huge subsidization of these installations. Uh, but but really, the, uh, if that for the poorest household is very difficult to bridge, uh, you know, the difference between the subsidy and the and the capital you have to invest to do that. So that's a very serious issue when we want the energy transition to, in a way, the citizen to be part of, then it's really important to see how the gap for the lower income households, how they can, in a way, fill that gap that for the moment it's not only a subsidy, but you need some, some time to have zero cost, at least as a start. So the second element, which I think is a little bit worrying is because well, electricity market as what they are, uh, it's difficult to show the result for the household that the bills will be much cheaper because of the uh, renewable energy and the clean energy transition. And that for the moment doesn't appear very much. It, it is different when you have, for example, in certain countries, totally decentralized power sector where there is relatively a cheap access, anyway, access to electricity when there is none. And there you see that in some African countries, I saw really a positive element of decentralized electricity, women's training to be in a way a provider for the village, for example. It's a good example that has been done in the past. You see that there is really a possibility of green transition being a sort of a support for gender equality. So, uh, but of course, this problem of the access, uh, affordable access to energy is really, really central for, in particular, women's development and uh, in, in particular in countries where there is no access. But even, even in where there is full access uh, to electricity or energy, if there is not, we don't solve the problem of the deep income inequality in countries that has increased so much since COVID, I think we will face that problem. Um, you are one of the key architects of the Paris Agreement. Uh, you served as France's special representative for COP21 in 2015 here in Paris and also a lead negotiator. Um, the preamble of the Paris Agreement highlights that parties must promote um, uh, gender equality, the empowerment of women. Have we lived up to to you know that element of the Paris Agreement? Well, I think uh, all this preamble was a very interesting discussion, by the way, because people were saying, why do we need a preamble? No, why we have climate justice, for example, or where, what, why we we have elements on, uh, you know, the recognition of the, in a way, the what the, some delegation from Latin America wanted the recognition of the existence of nature as a, a sort of a subject of, of legal element, legal existence. So all this was like, oh, they are there, but it's not important. But in reality, we look at climate justice discussion, it's now everywhere, no? 
because of course of the loss and damage in particular. Uh, there is of course these ideas that nature has to have a legal status in many countries. And now this empowerment of women is something. Uh, interesting enough, you see the evolution in the delegation at the UNFCCC, there is more and more women. There are those famous delegation where almost everyone is from the women's side. Uh, the Spanish one is a very famous one where you don't have only the top, but of course most of the team is, is, is from, is women, are women. Um, and as you may have seen, because uh, the committee preparation, preparing the COP29 in Baku was only composed with men, there was a letter that I signed together with many other women to say, look, you can't do that now. We are in 2024, you can't do that anymore. And they reacted, at least they, they name a champion that is a woman and they tried to put, to put you know, a space. So now it's considered that you can't do that, which is a big progress because before it was, oh, maybe it was nice to have, and now, oh, it, you can't do that. And that's good because uh, the perspective, the way of negotiating, um, you know, in Paris, I made a lot, a lot of the success with women. Remember, I remember very well how the minister of Brazil, the environment minister, Isabella Teixeira helped me in the last, in the last hours as the, of course, the South African minister who played a very, very big role, like the ambassador was my counterpart and was leading the G77 and China. You know, these women were there and have many, have kept relation with most of them. And I, I, it was sort of a trust building that has happened, of course, with Christiana Figueres as well, and Mary Robinson on the other side. And, and so th there was a network that has, you know, were built trust. And you know, at the last moment, at the last minute, you have to trust each other. And uh, if not, you never know, you know, in agreement is so, so complex and you need to finally find that you are not cheated because there is really recognition of what you need or what you would accept. And it's a recognition of the constraint of everyone. And that's where I think the women in Paris in particular played a big role. And you see them now coming more and more on the, on the scene at the, the leading roles in many, many places. And I think that that's a good thing. Several things that I want to unpack from what you just said. Uh, you mentioned, first of all, uh, COP29's um, committee in Azerbaijan. They initially nominated a, an all-male panel. Um, since then, um, the president has added 12 women to the, to the original 29 uh, men in that panel. It came as a shock for obvious reasons, for gender equality reasons. But beyond that, why do we need um, gender equality in, in the negotiations, in these international processes? Um, of course, it's not a simple way to, to respond to that question. But again, if you look at uh, how we should um, deal with climate, uh, you know, there is, of course, a certain way of, in a way, playing the big powers. And in particular, in this particular moment, we have really, as we decided in Dubai, to transition away from fossil fuels. It's, a, uh, you know, we have to represent the different perspective and the different interest in a, in a better way. Why we need women is that, <clears throat> First of all, they were always more sensitive because of their role in the family about the health issues, for example. Uh, I can say, and my foundation in particular, but many others and in the past have seen that air pollution and of course connected with fossil fuels, wh whatever it is through car pollution or um, thermal plant with coal or just the pollution of gas and, and oil, which are really heavy uh, when you look at the impact on the air, <coughs> that, that the women were more, more, much more sensitive to the quality, the health element. And that's an important discussion on climate. And it was not. Before it was all the cost or the benefit of that solution or not. It was terms of, you know, abstract words like CO2 quantity in the atmosphere. Uh, even if, of course, on the IPCC side, you see a lot of 
phys uh, women who are very good at physics and modeling, absolutely. But the, the element on how it connects with everyday life is really, really important. The second element is a poverty element and the social dimension of it. Again, even in the climate movement, I must say, um, before that, it was still, a, a, in a way, a community that was really interested in technological fixes, uh, technological targets, but less on the social element of that. And uh, we, we can't ignore that. So I think it's really good to have this perspective. And anyway, just because of the reality, uh, half of the population is, is women. So uh, there is no sense of saying they should not be part of this discussion. So, but I, I'm happy that the Azerbaijan government recognized that, even if it was a little late. From what you were saying, do you think, um, you know, over the years, this is not th something that you can point a finger and say, you know, this, you know, female activist or this one person changed the way that we perceived climate issues. But do you think that women have um, added, added a more human element, perhaps, to these issues in the sense that, as you were saying, it's not just um, about energy. It's not just about CO two. It's it's also human lives, and 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 have maybe made it a bit more real for people. I I do think so. Um, <clears throat> even in my own job, I think uh, I was recognized not only because I well, I knew the topic and I had experience, uh, which is a sort of normal base, you know, for you to do that job. Uh, but because I, I have a, a style where I was not trying to impose a view, but to begin to listen and to see where we could find a compromise. And um, I do think that that's a problem of the, the type of behavior is important. And we know that gender roles um, produce different behavior styles. That's very evident, of course. So in this particular case on diplomacy, I think it's super useful. Uh, because people feel always that their interests are under attack. So they are defensive. So the first step is to try to make them more comfortable about, yes, their interests are well taken, and there is no, th there, is, there is room to discuss. So that's really important, and I'm sure I have a lot of masculine diplomats colleagues that are very good at that, but that's something in our role in society we are more trained to do that uh, because that's just the way we have been educated. The second element is exactly this sensitivity about uh, the human dimension of it. We saw that on, uh, and, and, and again, you have seen that in the youth movement, you have seen that in the uh, adaptation issues where really uh, they were conducted by women thinking that was re re resilience is really important. So this human factor was certainly uh, brought by, by women mostly. Uh, and that's interesting. Another element, which I think was interesting, is initially, you know, um, people didn't see that they could make a career in climate. That's not was very exciting when you were in a government, but that's not a promising element. And so you see very, very, um, at least long time negotiators that were not normally in any, any time or all, all the time on the top of their delegation, but they were there for very, very long because they believe in the issue and they didn't have such a career plan that they should stay two years and then go on another job. And I, so I, I witnessed that, that there is a sort of uh, constant attention to these problems that had paid off finally. And you have very experienced women now in the, in, the, in the field, whether it is in business, whether it is in, in the diplomacy or in the NGO community as well. And uh, I think that, that I am absolutely fascinated to see how many women's network we have around climate now. I think there are four or five global networks that are talking to each other to try to in a way bridge the differences of perspective. So that was not existing before. So something is happening, yes, on this side. I, that resonates with me because as, as a journalist, I, I'm an environment reporter and, and editor, and it's, you know, it's been a few years now, and 
when I started um, working, um, I, I took an internship for a show on the environment and they only had girls. I mean, we've only had only girls. And for the past two years, we've had male candidates who actually want to work on the environment show. And that to me, I was like, something's changed. I mean, something changed. And that actually having a career, um, a meaningful career, an important career, um, you know, working on climate issues um, is something that, you know, young men are also interested in. Um, so it, it is really interesting that you say that. Um, from, you know, what you were saying um, during COP21, um, you talked about other women you worked with. Um, do you think um, it changed maybe the course of, of you know, the historic moment um, of the Paris Agreement, um, the fact that you you had, you know, the, the Brazilian environment minister working with you, I mean, without kind of blowing things out of proportion, but... No, of course, we, we should not, but <clears throat> uh, maybe, uh, I think that was sort of, not totally at the end, but, but um, probably after the first week, end of the first week, we had a lot of tension, of course, the normal one between G77 and, and you know, coming from, uh, from France, a developed country, a country that has a colonial past, it was not that easy to deal with many developing countries that could have legitimate, in a way, concern about uh, the attitude. And sometimes France is not, can be patronizing as well in the diplomacy. That's not always the case, but it can happen. And so I knew that I had that handicap. And um, at one point in time, I had a very nice, tough, but nice uh, encounter with uh, the one who was leading the G77 at ambassador level, so the uh, South African ambassador. And we had a very interesting conversation, and I show, I show her that I was really concerned about that, that I felt the handicap. And, uh, and that I wanted her to trust me. And it happened, some, something happened between us, something emotional, I can, I can tell. Um, and from that point, she trusted me. And so that makes a whole difference. E even at the end, where well, the, the end was particularly rocky on the last minutes of the, of the negotiation and the approval of the, of the text. A another example was, um, that was the last, I, I, and sorry for those who have heard me telling that anecdote, but at the end of the second week, just a Saturday and very early in the morning, I was talking to the different groups to not to show them the tech because it has to happen a little in, in the General Assembly of the, uh, of the Paris Agreement members or the ones who would have to approve it, but just to warn them about what was in it, not for them to be surprised, because that was uh, one of the lines of the French diplomacy that we should not surprise anybody. So people have to understand, it has to be transparent, and you have to understand what is happening and not be surprised. And so, because of course that was the last closure of the last decision that have been taken over the days, and uh, so they didn't know the final, final, you know, a cut, if I may say so. So I, I spent time in very early in the morning. I haven't slept for many, many hours, days maybe. And um, that was, I talked with the more, the countries were more difficult, the oil exporting countries mostly. And, um, and what, yes, what we call the like-minded uh, developing countries group. And I told them what was in the text, what they would like and they would hate and that the best thing I could provide for them. And after a moment, there was a very, very big silence, a terrible silence, I must say. And then I said, look, I can't do better. So I think it's the best balance I can find. And if it's not that, so we cannot do the agreement, we can't do it. And so again, very long silence. And at that time I was so exhausted. I said, well, it's over, I cannot do anymore. And I began to be so emotional, I, I been crying just out of exhaustion. And then uh, a woman, the ambassador for Venezuela, Claudia, get up and said, and she came to me, she took me in her arms 
followed by all the ambassadors who were there, and they told me, we will trust you. That has made a difference on the final day. I don't think she has not done that, and she, if I haven't that emotional moment with them, and you, I, I had the proof afterwards, uh, we should not have uh, finalized this. So yes, yeah, sometimes personal relation matters enormously, and that was the case. Um, you were a hugely influential person, um, you know, during COP21, the signing of, of this agreement. Um, what are the main lessons you take away from that experience and, and you hope could inform, um, you know, future negotiations, um, which are bound to be as crucial as, as, you know, the, the agreement. So, and I'm flying to Brazil next week to work with Brazilian colleagues. I think uh, there are very simple lessons if we don't want to have this acrimony of some groups feeling, feeling that they have been left on the side. And so I do think we have the, all the means to be transparent in the way, and, and I know it's, there is a tendency to say, oh, it's good to have a text at the end of the day and say, take it or leave it. I don't think it's the best way for the resilience of the agreement. And I take the resilience of Paris Agreement, even with Trump decision to withdraw, even with pushback from many actors, that finally nobody, and even from the youth movement, the business, the IMF, everybody is related to that agreement because it has been constructed with everybody, with everyone. And one after that, um, just at the end when we were always, you know, people were jumping and dancing. It was just an extraordinary atmosphere on the, on the, after the approval. Uh, one young woman from Latin America, she was from Colombia, told me, I didn't believe we will recognize our work in that text. And they say, we see that. We see the paragraph we drafted. It's not something you have taken out of your pocket. It's a result of long hours and long effort of everybody. So my first recommendation is uh, being on a transparent mode. And that's why we, at least that was our strategy to uh, go along the transformation of the text each day to show that people know what was happening. No closed door discussion. I don't think there are they can be useful on the day one, at the last minute, yes. But after that, everybody would read the agreement differently. They would say, no, that's, and, and, and I can say that, that's a danger. Uh, the good thing is the Paris Agreement, you see many people saying, I did it. And that's fine. That's extraordinary. From, you know, the president of US or Barack Obama to, um, whoever, you have many authors, you have many owners, and that, that's a success. That's really the recipe of success. So that's why I think it's very good. So listening, transparency, taking in account all the interest in the most transparent way you can, and in particular, giving the, you know, the one who are most vulnerable the lead is really important. If it's a negotiation between big powers, I don't think we have we will have had a good ambitious enough agreement. If you can really put the, these vulnerable countries at the lead, which was finally what happened for the 1.5, in a way, target was exactly the production of their action. Uh, I think then you make a total difference on on what you can do. So that I think these elements are, I think are important. Uh, I don't know if other people would like to follow that. Um, we, one final question. Um, we've been asking the same question um, every single guest. Um, so um, here's a question. If you had a magic wand and could change uh, one thing in the world for a more sustainable planet, um, what would you do? What would it be? <clears throat> I would not take the Beyonce thing, like women's lead the world, but I think it would <laughs> improve things. Of course, there is no magic wand. But I think if there is a, I think we have to rely on 
rely on the agency of people. More and more, I think that because of the politics, the political economy of many decisions, we have to rely on the good information and then on the agency of the citizen all over the world. I think we have to have citizens pressing for the solutions as a safe solution for us, for the planet, for the humanity. And um, so empowerment of citizens for me is a magic one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing you. your your expertise and your story um, that's been, you know, as all we all know, so so influential in, in the climate space. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.